What just happened back there? Hollywood's been hit. Those krauts knocked him out. I saw the shot. It came from the hedgerow to our right. 200 meters out. Oh god, that's a tiger. We're done, man. We're done. Cut the chatter. Everyone, hard right and spread out. Advance on that kraut bastard. Ah, oh, fuck me! Knock out those kraut bastards! Well, that wasn't hard! Let me just start off the video by saying my perspective is completely unbiased. Personally, I've never been that interested in tanks. I've never really understood the hype around them. Now military uniforms, however, whew, well, now that's a different story. But if I've never been that interested in tanks, then how come I'm making this epic tank down of the legendary Tiger tank? Well, that's an excellent question. It all started the other day when I was gaming down on some shooty Call of Duty Black Ops 2E on the PCE with my good friend and upstanding Italian-American citizen, Eel Cookie. While playing an intense round of zombies, he asked me if I ever heard of Wearaboos. I asked him if this is some group of degenerates in his stupid degenerate game of War Thunder, and he simply answered, Yeah, that's right! For those of you who don't know, a wearaboo is someone online who spouts about how great Germany was during World War II. Some are just wannabe armchair historians who believe populist myths about World War II, while some of them are actual full-blown neo and or crypto-Nazis. Either way though, they all talk about how Germany had the best generals, the best equipment, the best strats, and relevant to us, the best tanks. Oh boy do they ever talk about their tanks. And there's one in particular that, in all circles, even outside of Wearaboos, has been associated with quote-unquote perfect German tank design. You know it. You love it. I'm of course talking about the Panzerkampfwagen 6, aka the Tiger Tank. The so-called best tank of World War II. The Tiger Tank is nowadays remembered in pop history as the most powerful and deadly tank of World War II, especially when it comes to fighting against American tanks, which are in turn popularly remembered as weak and totally unfit to fight, especially when it came to Tigers. Because that's the normal amount of support for three Tiger tanks. Tigers? Where the hell did Tigers come from? Well, that's why we have Oddball and his Shermans. Does he know about the Tigers? Not yet, no. You bet your sweet ass he doesn't. Or he'd still be on that funny farm of his. He may be nuts, but he's not crazy enough to put Shermans up against Tigers. And, on paper at least, it can be kind of understood why. First introduced in 1942, the Tiger, aka the Panzer VI, aka the Tiger I, was meant at the time to act as an effective counter to newer Soviet T-34 models on the Eastern Front. Though it should be noted that the earliest known designs for what would eventually become the Tiger date back to as early as 1937. When first introduced in North Africa and in Russia, the Tiger was very impressive, if flawed. The tank came with an 8.8 centimeter cannon and 100 millimeters of frontal armor on the hull, as well as 60 to 80 millimeters of armor on either one of its sides. In short, for 1942, the Tiger tank was a beast that the Allies had a rough time of taming in combat. Though some anti-tank guns were capable of penetrating the Tiger's armor, pretty much no tank at the time could effectively counter it without having the numbers to do so. However, the Tiger was by no means a perfect tank. Throughout its lifespan, it would suffer from over-engineering, 
breakdowns and engine failures were not rare occurrences. And because of the overall constant overextension of German logistics, as well as the rarity and complex nature of the parts used to make the tank, you know, run, a breakdown typically meant that the tank was just done for anyway. The suspension system would also often easily get clogged and jammed up, usually with mud. This was especially common along the eastern front, where poor roads and thick muddy fields made up the bulk of Russia's countryside and system of infrastructure. In fact, many Tigers in the eastern front wouldn't even get into combat, just because of how many Tigers were abandoned due to mechanical flaws. Now that we've got the flaws and advantages out of the way for the Tiger, let's take a look at its supposedly inferior competitor, the Sherman. The first official variant was simply called the M4 Sherman, and it saw combat for the first time in 1942, the same year as the Tiger actually, at the Second Battle of El Alamein. The initial M4 design came equipped with a 75mm cannon and about 51mm two inches, of frontal sloped armor. This may seem pretty light, especially when compared to the Tiger, but as an upside to this, the Sherman was one of the fastest medium tanks of not only 1942, but also of the entire war. We also have to remember that when the Sherman made its debut, it was never meant to go up against heavy tanks like the Tiger, and was meant to combat the German Panzers III and IV, which the Sherman was very capable at doing. So much so, that it was essentially one of the key pieces of weaponry that turned the tide of the North African campaign in the Allies' favor from just how many were shipped over the Atlantic, and the overall quality they were built with. But of course the M4 wasn't perfect. Despite being capable of taking out medium Axis tanks, said Axis tanks were also very capable of taking out the Sherman with its light armor thickness. And the 75mm cannon, while it got the job done when it was new, quickly became inadequate against later versions of Panzers, never mind German heavy tanks like the Tiger. In fact, once Sherman tank crews began to encounter the German Tigers in North Africa, and later in Italy, it was clear to the Allied leaders that the Sherman would not be what single-handedly drove them to a speedy victory, which was actually something that Allied commanders believed at the time. The British were the first one to solve the Tiger problem, their solution was a humble little tank known as the Sherman Firefly. The Firefly was essentially just an M4 Sherman tank, but with the British 17-pounder anti-tank gun shoved into the turret instead of the standard 75mm gun. And I do mean shoved into. Sir, 17-pounder won't fit! Put it inside what? The radio won't fit! Put a hole in the back and have it stick out the back. The engine's no good! Get five car engines and put them together. The 17-pounder gun was more than a match for the Tiger, being able to easily penetrate the thick frontal armor of the Tiger from up to even a thousand meters away, as well as the armor of the Panther tank and Tiger II. Though initially designed in 43, the Firefly would not see combat until July of 1944, just after the Normandy landings. But when the tanks did see combat, they tended to perform exceptionally well, the most famous example of which being when one Sherman Firefly commanded by British tank commander Sergeant Harris knocked out five Panther tanks with five individual rounds during the Battle of Langevin. You'd think that a tank like this would be readily embraced by the Allies, however, only around 2,000 of these tanks would ever be produced, compared to the almost 50,000 Shermans produced over the course of the whole war. The main reason for why the tank was never produced on a large scale was because, get this, American tank manufacturers were extremely resistant to the idea of putting a foreign gun inside of their American-made tank hulls, because apparently their bottom line was more important than the lives of American soldiers, but hey, that's life. That being said though, the Americans weren't far behind on their own tiger killer. Meet the Sherman M4A3 E8. Ooh, that's a mouthful. This tank is better known as the Easy 8 tank. The Easy 8 Sherman went into production in August of 1944 and saw combat for the first time during the Battle of the Bulge. The tank was based on British designs, which is to say, they copied the Firefly, stuck their own 76mm gun in it, upgraded the armor and engine a bit, and then called it a day. Regardless, the tank performed essentially as well as the Firefly, and better yet, was produced in much greater numbers. In August of 1944 alone, 2,617 Easy 8 tanks were produced, as opposed to the 2,000 to 2,100 Fireflies produced over the course of three whole years. Of course, there are many many more variants of the Sherman that exist than the ones I've listed here, but these are the ones I felt were the most relevant to the discussion. So now that I feel I've gotten a lot of the basic information out of the way, we can now actually talk about which tank was superior, the Sherman or the Tiger. Well, if I may be so bold as to divert from the typical black and white response to this question, there's no simple yes or no response. 
We have to remember that these tanks were both used in the service of their respective militaries for a very similar amount of time, and were each designed for very different reasons and for suiting different doctrines. So instead of pulling the same generic yes or no response you've seen done countless times in both camps, I'm instead going to break down their performances on a year-by-year -year basis from 42 to 45, and give my opinion on which tank ended up being superior by the war's end. And just to clarify once again, the Eastern Front will not be taken into consideration in this particular instance, just the African and Western Fronts. Starting off in 1942, I'm going to have to give the first year to the Tiger. Whoa, but hold on a minute. Allow me to explain my reasoning for this decision. Just because the Tiger starts with an edge over the Sherman, that in no way entails that the M4 Sherman was a bad tank in 1942. We need to remember, the Sherman was never initially meant to go up against the Tiger or tanks like it. Which is to say, its purpose in 1942 was not to counter heavy tanks, but to effectively counter Axis and medium tanks, which it did well. There was no way Allied tank designers could have predicted that the Germans were about to place a tank as heavy as the Tiger on the front lines. So it's only natural that Shermans weren't properly equipped to handle them. The Tiger's purpose, however, was to act as a powerful heavy tank to counter both Allied light and medium tanks at the time, which it also did well. And although there were never very many of them in North Africa, and German logistics weren't able to properly keep these massive gas guzzlers moving around the clock, which is something we'll definitely be coming back to later, North Africa is where the Panzer VI certainly first earned its reputation, and it ended up doing enough damage that Allied tank designers began to scramble to redesign the Sherman for the sole intent of countering this one tank. So 1942, I'd say, would have to go to the Tiger. 1943, a year where much of the fighting in Europe would take place in Italy, is a bit trickier for me to come to a consensus on. On one hand, it would still be about another year before the Firefly and Easy 8 would begin to roll onto the battlefield, meaning that in 43, the 75mm would still be the main armament for the Sherman tank. But, Due to information gathered on captured Tigers in the Western and Eastern fronts, as well as general learning experience, Allied tank crews had become very extensively informed on how exactly they could effectively kill slash disable Tiger tanks. Tiger is an open country tank. We happen to have these in a small town with narrow streets, and we do have the element of surprise. Yeah. Look, Kelly, a Tiger has only one weak point. That's its ass. You gotta hit it point blank, and you gotta hit it from behind. And generally speaking, once Allied tank crews knew where to target, they could use their better speed and maneuverability, as well as their superior numbers, to effectively outflank the Tigers in multiple directions. But at the same time, by this point in the war, the Axis powers in Europe were firmly on the defensive, which gave a huge advantage to the Tiger with its powerful gun. Many Sherman losses would be racked up, both in Italy and later on in France, by German tanks that would camp in brush or between buildings and pick off columns of Shermans as they drove by. It's very likely that instances of ambushes like this is largely where the myth of Tiger invincibility comes from, namely, that it took at least five Shermans to kill one tiger. So when it came to fighting in Italy in 1943, which tank do I think was superior? Honestly, I'd have to call it a draw. By this time, Sherman tank crews had the proper training, know-how, and experience to be able to counter the Tiger tank in combat. The Sherman's speed and maneuverability also gave it a huge advantage for fighting in the Italian countryside, and in increasing amounts of urban combat. But the Tiger, being on the defensive very often, meant that it often got the first shot off on Allied tanks. And speedy or not, the 75mm gun was still a huge disadvantage for the Sherman, as even at close ranges, it was largely incapable of penetrating the frontal armor of the Tiger, and could only effectively knock it out by hitting it in the sides or from behind. 1944 was the year of the Normandy landings. It was also the year that the Allies finally began to produce tanks that were capable of being more than a match against the Tigers. And it was these tanks, the Firefly and Easy 8 Sherman, that truly outshined the Tiger. Both of these Allied tanks had the previous advantages of speed and maneuverability, while also having a cannon that could easily knock out a Tiger from up to a thousand plus meters. Pretty much the only thing the Tiger could claim to have over the Allies was the advantage of fighting defensively, which, while fighting in France, was a huge W for Germany, as the thick hedgerow-filled countryside and towns provided excellent concealment and ambush opportunities for German tanks. Most of the time when Shermans fought against Tigers in France, it wasn't on an open battlefield on some field or hillside, so much as it was the Allies being fired on from a bush somewhere, and the Shermans scrambling to find out who was shooting at them and from what direction. But aside from having the bonus of fighting defensively, the Tiger was at 
at a disadvantage in pretty much every other department against the most up-to-date Sherman models. It was slower, more prone to mechanical failures, and much more expensive and resource-intensive to produce. And worse yet, by the time of the Battle of the Bulge in December, Germany had essentially drained its petrol supply and could hardly keep many of these massive tanks running consistently. German logistics also by that point had pretty much all but collapsed making it harder to refuel the few tanks that were even capable of refueling, and harder to deliver spare parts to tank crews that needed to make repairs, which by the battle's end ultimately led to many heavy tanks being abandoned and captured rather than destroyed. So yeah, 1944, a huge point for the Allies. 1945, if I'm being honest, is pretty similar to 44 in most aspects, except that now the Allies had a lot more very capable tanks to throw at the Germans, and the Germans now had even fewer tanks than in 1944, all of which were pretty much inferior to Allied tanks. And worse yet, they had almost no fuel to keep many of them running. All the same problems the Tiger had when put up against the Firefly and E8 tanks still existed as well. So, naturally, that's a point for the Allies. So there, in my own humble and 100% objectively right opinion, the Sherman was the overall better tank than the Tiger I. But, as you can see by the 3-2 score, for a large part of these tanks' existence, that was not overwhelmingly so. When the Sherman and Tiger were both introduced in North Africa in 1942, a legitimate argument could be made that, even if flawed in some ways, the Tiger was much more than a match for the Sherman. However, while the Allies opted to improve the Sherman design over the course of the war, the Germans hardly changed much about the Tiger, and yet continued to produce it while simultaneously designing and producing heavier and more outrageous tanks. Now look, I like the Tiger, and if I'm being honest, for its time, it was a good tank. But was it superior to the Sherman, and does it truly deserve its near-mythical legacy? No. It was never at any point that good a tank. But if you ask me, I think the biggest problem doesn't necessarily lie with the tank itself, for the most part, so much as it lies with the mindset of the German military. Instead of improving upon existing designs like the Tiger and fixing the issues that tank crews had with these tanks, they would instead just throw resources and fuel at building and sending out bigger and more impractical tanks, while still building and fueling their previous big tanks. When in reality, what they should have been doing was what the Allies were doing. That is, build a few foundationally good tanks, and build upon that foundation how circumstance would eventually demand that they oughta. The Tiger tank, for the Germans, was one of those good foundations, but also one that would never be built upon. Oh, 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 oh! Huh? See? What did I tell you, huh? Now look, the trade for the uniforms I can understand, but to buy this tank, you gotta be crazy! It's a mother beautiful tank. It's a piece of junk. The fuel system leaks all over the place. It's a piece of junk! Always with the negative waves, Moriarty. Always with the negative waves. Right. Oh! 